Hi, welcome to B-Sides. Um, this is the We the People Providing for a Common Defense with CBD with Matthew Cornelius and Cameron Dixon. Um, first, we'd like to thank our sponsors. Uh, without this, this event would not be possible. Um, before we get started, please make sure your cell phones are off or silent. And um, towards the end, we will be having a, we will be opening it up for questions if there is time. I'll be passing around the mic as needed. Uh, without further ado, our speakers. Thank you, everyone. Thanks and welcome. Hello, I'm Cameron. I'm Matthew. Um, today we're gonna to talk about providing for a common defense with coordinated vulnerability disclosure. This is a quote from the preamble. But what we're really gonna talk about after we take care of some feedback. Let's make it easier for the public to tell the US government about security issues in our systems and require agencies to do something about it. That's our aim here. Yeah, it shouldn't be so hard. We think that we can, we can solve for this. So it's early in the talk, but it's audience participation time. Um, has anybody here, by show of hands, ever tried to report something to a government agency? Uh, those that, who have hands up, uh, go ahead and characterize your experience with a thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs sideways. Uh, I see the gubbies in the back with thumbs up <laughs> and everybody else saying like, I don't think this works very well. Um, so uh, at That's me. Yeah, this, I think it's the other this lights mics off. I'll shut them off. Yeah, there they go. Hold steady. It's not dead, it's <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for your help. Uh, so as a government official, um, I appreciate and find deep resonance in the experience of my uh, fellow public servant. That's Wilkie Twycross of the Ministry of Magic. Uh, he was the apparition instructor in 1997 with Harry Potter and his friends at the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and, and Wizardry. Uh, see, uh, Wilkie, he told the students that to apparate, an apparition is where you transport from one place to another without traversing the distance between. Um, that in order to do that, you have to focus on the three Ds. That's destination, determination, and deliberation. And in fact, these are the three stages of uh, vulnerability disclosure that you might experience as well. Uh, D1 is, where does this go? And D2 is, am I willing to go through the hassle of trying to find the right place to send this? D3 is actually recipient side where uh, folks are like, yeah, I'll, I'll deliberate about that. I'll, I'll think about resolving that. Um, so like splinching, uh, which also in Harry Potter is, is a, a, a painful experience where it, upon apparition, you might leave an eyebrow or, or some body part behind. This experience can be really painful. Um, we think that there's a, there can be a better way, and we're interested in feedback and thoughts on, on what we have to share and whether it, it might work. Um, so a de facto way for many people to report a security vulnerability is at the domain or at the host name where you found something is to send a message to the security app. Um, this is not a new concept, at least you know, in, in May of 1997, this was in, a, in an RFC standards track. Um, and in a new, within this doc, it enumerated a set of uh, boxes that organizations could maintain and it named their purpose. Here's security for security bulletins and queries. You may not know this, uh, but the US government actually publishes the full list of .gov domain names. Um, this is something that is published and, and updated about once a, a month on average. Um, so you can see here that this list is, uh, it's also organized by domain type, so that you can see the executive, legislative, and judicial branches. Uh, the, the one here on the screen is the, the uh, federal executive, or excuse me, the federal agencies. There's a full list called current uh, full with everything with, that includes all state and local uh, domains. If you search for, for gsadata.gov, you'll, you'll find the full list. So I had a thought about four weeks ago. What if I emailed all the security ads in the federal executive branch? What would happen? What, would I get a response? Would I hit bounce backs, um, auto replies? So I, I, I thought about this and thought well, that, that'd be a fun thing to do. Uh, so, I, so I attempted that. So I emailed DOJ. I emailed the IRS. I emailed fruitsandveggiesmatter.gov. <laughs> this is thanks to the, uh, our friends at the Department of Health and Human Services. But you know, 
what I saw in response wasn't actually super encouraging. So um, this is mildly redacted to protect the innocent. Um, you, you may be aware that at the end of last year, in the beginning of this year, there was a, a lapse in, in appropriations for the federal government. I sent this message on July, uh, let's see, I sent the message on July 8th. I got an auto reply that uh, indicated that uh, they were still um, on furlough. Um, so, <laughs> Uh, the, 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 we're, we're actually working now, and so there was an appropriation. Uh, but that was about 112 days past the shutdown that this was still there. Now, to be fair, people are busy. There's no requirement for them to maintain this. But this isn't a great look. I think it demonstrates an opportunity for us to improve. Uh, so I did some math, or at least Google did. And I have some metrics that say about one out of every 100 federal executive branch uh, agencies maintain a security app. This was pretty disappointing. I didn't expect this to be very high, but this was this didn't meet up. So again, um, I, I'm kind of cheating here. Like, There's no mandate. There's no requirement for people to maintain this. And within federal agencies, unless there's a requirement, people don't usually do it. Um, they could also maintain a, uh, you know, a different address. They could have a, a web application for folks to report that to. I, this was just kind of a test. Um, but yeah, again, an opportunity to improve. Do you want to talk a little bit about the uh, cyber EO? Sure. So uh, what Cameron has started to lay out for everyone seems like a very uh, safe and interesting story, right? It's like, oh, that seems smart. Why aren't people doing that? If they have security at addresses, why are there not people responding to them? Uh, it seems smart that agencies would have a way for you all to communicate on whatever you might want to communicate to the agency, and yet here everyone is not talking about that. So. Uh, that led Cameron and I uh, down this path to where we are now. But taking a step back to the beginning of this administration, uh, this executive order, which came out uh, in May, uh, which we just refer to as the Cyber EO or EO 13800 in government speak, uh, basically set a brand new strategy for how we want to manage risk and manage technology across the federal executive branch enterprise with a very clear mandate that comes up front, which I don't think a lot of folks would uh, would say is inherent in the way this administration operates, which is the executive branch operates information technology, including all the security, all the procurements, everything else that wraps around how the federal government does technology on behalf of the American people, right? We don't do it because agencies like to do it or because they have appropriations that tell them to do it or because they like the programs that they have uh, or because of what their individual agency missions is. It is we do what we do to serve you all the taxpayers, whether you're in information security or you're a doctor or you're an educator or whatever it may be. So if we are doing things that do not, one, provide you benefit, and two, allow you to opine and provide us information and communicate with us in a way that allows us to resolve problems we both agree are worth resolving, we're not doing it right. Uh, so it shouldn't have been necessary that there was an executive order that tells us how to do this, but that is the frame under which we're operating right now, which I think both Cameron and I uh, would agree, and I hope most of the folks in the audience would agree, is a smart thing to do, a wise thing to do, and a responsible thing to do. Um, so. Uh, show of hands, how many folks came to the DDS presentation at 1 o'clock with Harlan and everything else? Uh, super cool, right? They gave a lot of great examples. They talked about all the superpowers they have. Uh, they talked about the really interesting stuff they're doing inside the Pentagon. Well, Cameron and I, after we just showed you that really nice story of telling you how we operate IT on behalf of the American people, we're now going to tell you how that doesn't happen anywhere outside of the Pentagon. So I know some folks, some folks brought some beers in here, which I think is great because you're going to need them to see how things are totally different in the space in which we operate. So uh, we're going to paint that picture for you and then tell you what we're trying to do to fix some of those inherent problems and how the executive branch, the sort of non-defense branch of government, operates. Right. Uh, so these are the main players uh, and everything. And, and as someone that works in the executive office of the president, and for the record, I don't think I was the email address that Harlan put in this afternoon, but if I am, I need to figure out how he got that presentation cleared. Um, so uh, I do appreciate that Cameron made the executive office of the president the largest symbol over here. Uh, we are the most powerful. We do have the most authority on this. Uh, we're not saying we're always right about things, but we certainly think we are. Uh, and, and we have both the money and the power to help all these other agencies do stuff. So if you think about it, uh, the EOP, uh, we oversee the budget and the sort of management policy and everything else for all the executive branch agencies, all of whom you see represented in some cases down here. 
Well, there's three main partners in how we manage IT and information security across the government that also help us do cross-cutting initiatives. So DHS, where Cameron sits, that focuses on federal cybersecurity. GSA, which is a big technology driver, uh, procurement driver, uh, and a lot of, uh, they run a lot of federal government-wide sort of technology programs that help us sort of manage IT broadly. And then NIST, uh, who you all probably know, who set standards uh, and help uh, help us at the EOP level promulgate those standards and sort of push them out through policy uh, across the executive branch. One, if I can chime in, one thing that's crucial to understand is that each individual agency, that they are the kings and queens of their own castle. Um, so they, they manage their own infrastructure, they manage their systems. There's not one single department of information security or, or information systems. That, that's a good thing. Um, each individual agency has their own mission. They uh, protect the environment. They go to space. Uh, you know, they, they provide housing. Um, the, each of them maintains those systems and how they deliver those services and how they secure those services are, are informed by that mission. Um, and not only is this just how things work, but it's actually the law. So the Federal Information Security Management Act or Modernization Act of 2014, Management Act of I think 2002, um, it, it instructs that individual agencies that they own and manage these systems. And that the Office of Management and Budget, that they perform oversight. Um, over federal agency information security practices. So OMB can issue memorandum, uh, they'll track performance metrics, they'll hold agency heads accountable uh, for this. This, this, is, this is in statute, this is law. Um, we've, we've kind of talked about this as well, but FISMA also gives pretty clear instructions to CISA and to NIST, uh, where OMB is the oversight arm. We administer at at CISA, the Cyber and Infrastructure Security Agency via DHS, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, we administer the implementation of information security policies. So that uh, maybe sounds like uh, bureaucraties. Um, <laughs> but uh, we, we also, in statute, are required to provide technical assistance uh, to agencies. So the statute requires that CISA uh, make sure that everything that we do is in line with uh, NIST standards and uh, the, the, the things that they promulgate, their best practices as well. Uh, within FISMA, this is an, an interesting thing, uh, we are given the authority, uh, the authority to issue binding operational directives uh, to basically tell sideways, sister uh, federal executive branch agencies to do a thing relevant underneath information security. Um, to date, we've issued, I think, eight or nine of these. Um, you can go to cyber.dhs.gov and all of them are, are, are there. You can see what they are, the, the tasks that are given to agencies, um, you know, their, their requirements underneath these directives. So this is weird because we, again, are not in a uh, position of, of authority, uh, you know, hierarchically uh, over these organizations. We are, we are uh, sister agencies, which is, which is different. Um, at OMB, they have kind of a similar authority um, where they can, you know, they can do more things than just information security, but they can issue memorandums. So here's an example from 2015 uh, that was issued that required secure connections. It required uh, the federal executive branch agencies to use HTTPS for all of their uh, web, for all of their internet-facing infrastructure. This is a good thing. Um, so the, we've built this story because there could be a federal mandate to do. Uh, coordinated vulnerability disclosure to the federal government better. And that's, th we'd like to talk a little bit about that. So what might that look like? Well, there's some prior art here. Uh, within the General Services Administration, which is the most excitingly named organization within the government, uh, there is a, a sub-organization called the Technology Transformation Services. And some, some folks may know uh, 18F, which is uh, top-notch uh, folks who work there. They created the first civilian uh, branch vulnerability disclosure policy. Uh, you, you can uh, search for it. It's a great doc. Um, they, the, the, the intent of a vulnerability disclosure policy is, one, to make it really clear where folks can be able to deliver their, their findings, but also to grant clear authorization that you are enabled to take certain action. And if you do those things in good faith and follow our policy, we won't sue you. That protects you. And that provides a, an incentive for agencies to take action, to remediate, to, to, to prioritize whatever you've reported versus the, the 70 other things that they also have to do. Uh, our, our friends at the DOD also have a vulnerability disclosure policy, um, and, and it's great, good stuff. So there's some pull and pressure. That, well, what if, what if CISA performed a similar role to what DOD does for, uh, for executive branch agencies? 
we, we want to replicate that success because they've done really great work. Um, but it's important to acknowledge like the different legal and organizational operating environments between DOD and CISA, as well as like our individual agencies in relationship to the others. So despite the layers of, hier of hierarchy between them, ultimately the relationship between the DOD and individual computers of the armed services is one of parent-child. Uh, the relationship between CISA and the systems of the, so, so my organization, and the systems of the civilian executive branch agencies is a difference of kind and not degree. So here's my cute kids. Um, CISA is not responsible for the operation and maintenance of individual agency systems. Uh, again, we administer the implementation of information security practices, but we don't run those systems. And our relationship is ultimately one of sibling to these agencies. Um, so each, again, each agency has their own unique mission, and the maintenance of their systems is tied to the, to the, the, to the delivery of the services that they manage. Um, ultimately, vulnerability remediation is like not a different thing from the maintenance of your system. And as a, effectively, as a third party, CIS is not in the best position for us to evaluate the severity of a report, nor to rank it against the, the range of priorities that the agency has. They are closest to the, the care and feeding of that system, and uh, they are in, in a role where they can provide immediate or, or much faster than we can without playing a game of telephone, sending it to us, and for us to try and triage it and, and navigate it. So there's a couple of approaches that could take here. There are clear benefits of having things be centralized, or kind of the, the DOD model, where, where they are the front door. But there's also the standing you know, way of doing things, and that is the law uh, of FISMA, um, where there is, there is governance, and that's promulgated effectively centralized between uh, you know, our, our organizations. Um, but operations occur are distributed. Um, so there's opportunity for us to think about how can we get the benefits of the centralized model underneath a, a mechanism where things are, are effectively distributed. Um, I think there's this huge value in having, say, a single executive branch VDP where you know, anything you find in the federal government, there's one place, there's one policy. Um, the, the trade-off there is that the, the distributed way would be that there is you know, a policy saying that individual agencies must have a VDP. That aligns actually pretty well with what a standard VDP is. The organization who manages their systems promulgates a policy. It would be kind of weird for us to promulgate a policy for individual agencies when we don't manage those systems. We, it would be difficult for us to have defined scope. It would be also pretty challenging, I think, to be able to say from the get-go upon issuance of, a, of a, you know, a, a directive or a policy to say, OK, everything needs to be online. I think it, having a single uh, you know, federal VDP is a good goal. And I think that that's something that we can work towards. I think that it would be very difficult and painful immediately. So the, the, some of the benefits of having this is that there's a single point of entry for everybody. Uh, for, for people who want to uh, report vulnerabilities. There's also a single point of management for, for DOD in this instance. Um, it provides them a sense of visibility of like what's coming in. Uh, it allows them to be able to check that the, the fix has actually remediated the, the flaw that was found. Um, and, and hey, DOD is actually presently resourced in their environment to do this. Um, the organization that was known as US CERT, even though the domain still exists, uh, do doesn't actually exist anymore. Um, it's, it's, do, do they have a security yet? Uh, no, I, I didn't get a response from that. Uh, uh, got, 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 got a 550 there. Um, so the, 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 I think that there is power in trying to figure out a way, how can we do some, something that gets us the benefits of, of uh, a centralized model, but um, still operate in the way that things are going? I would love to be able to say, like, well, let's, let's, fix, have, let, let's fix everything first, um, and you know, then we can, we can make this happen. There's something to be said by just kind of operating in the environment that we have and getting little wins and working towards to make something better um, versus you know, waiting months and years to try and figure out that great opportunity when we fixed all of the backlog um, in order to, to accomplish a goal. If that's what you want to say about that? Yeah, and I think Cameron and I are trying to be realistic about what we're trying to achieve here, right? Like there's plenty of times that OMB puts out policy and says agencies shall do X. 
right? And that's the management side of OMB. So OMB has two, two big groups, just sort of briefly for folks that uh, are not government geeks. So the management side, which oversees cross-cutting initiatives uh, throughout the federal executive branch. So whether that's technology, financial management, procurement, performance, all this sort of stuff. And then within OMB, we're also siloed because all the folks on the budget side have their own agencies or their own bureaus or everything else that they manage and they oversee the money for, they apportion those funds. Congress gives the executive branch the money. OMB then tells the agencies how they're allowed to spend that money and then opens or closes the spigot based on how they do it. So we can do big things and sometimes OMB puts out large policy that says, thou, all agencies, thou shalt do X by Y date. Right? And most of the time that happens because we on the management side have won a battle, a bureaucratic battle inside the agency to do that, but that in no way means that the agency has resources available to actually do what we've told them to do. And then we spend months and years and budget cycles trying to say, no, no, no this is important because M1617 or M1814 says that you should do this, but most of the agencies do not have resources or it's not really a priority for them. So the other way to go about doing this, which I think is where Cameron and I and our agencies, which have a history, even though FISMA says OMB does X, DHS does X, we have a history of not working very well together, right? At the, at the macro level, at the political level, uh, OMB wants to do one thing, DHS often wants to do another thing, and it's a more combative relationship than a productive one. So what we are saying is like, why don't we sort of roll this out through the normal processes and try to get a try to get agencies accustomed to all this, right? So, um, in our 2020 budget, I'm getting really bureaucratic and wonky here. In the 2020 budget, uh, we put language in there that basically said agency some agencies are already moving out on bug bounties. Some have already seen successes in implementing their own vulnerability disclosure policies. This is something we should move towards. Then every spring, OMB puts out budget guidance that says agencies shall do X with their budgets, and then there's a supplemental that goes along with that to say as you are preparing your budget, also put prioritization on these sort of key areas. And a lot of those things align to things like the President's Management Agenda, which you can find on performance.gov. Had to get my plug in there since, I, since I'm here B-sides. But one of those things that we said, which was not attached to any memo or any policy or any bot or anything else we have out there, is agencies should be preparing to resource themselves so that they can run vulnerability disclosure programs and accept um, collect, use, and triage and mitigate the reports that they find effectively within the scope of their own resources, uh, their own risk tolerance, everything else. So rather than starting out with a blank sheet of paper that we put a great idea on and say agencies go do X, we've already started to get them primed for this. So no matter what path we take from a policy standpoint, no matter what we do from a budget standpoint, Agencies should be willing and ready and capable of doing this effectively because the worst thing that can happen is if we tell agencies to do this and we publicize it and we get you all in the information security community like super hyped up about it and then they all just sit on their hands or they all put up a web page that gives you another email address that goes into an inbox to nowhere. Right? Like, that is, the, that is the way we shut down all of the goodwill we've tried to build with this community whether it's the very specific stuff that the Defense Digital Service is doing, whether it's the broader governmental efforts that we have when we go to RSA or we come here to B-Sides or Black Hat or DEF CON and try to open ourselves up to all the great work that you're doing. But we've made the choice already as a government that we don't want to spend a lot more money, although Congress has uh, something else to say about that with the new cap deal. So how do we get better, smarter information at less cost where we're not hiring more federal employees? We allow this community, who cares, who wants to report responsibly and wants to help us fix issues that could have deleterious impacts on uh, the public or on government operations or anything else, we can do that in an effective, thoughtful manner. Now, it may not be as much as what folks would want if you had total control, if you had that parent-child relationship, but this is still a pretty broad stretch within the constructs we operate in within FISMA to actually do this in a thoughtful, responsible way where we force agencies to build that floor and then give them the ladders, whether it's resources or budgetary authority or, uh, or, or sort of focus on prioritization to move further faster and to get to where I think Cameron's going to tell folks we want to be uh, sort of going forward. Part of the thing that I think is challenging is that um, com complexity, I think, is the thing that makes security really hard, besides you know, people. Um, when CISA is presently not, per not 
uh, you know, resource in a position where we can be the central uh, focal point. And it's not clear to me that uh, a you know, piece of legislation that says notwithstanding any other clause, or not, not within any other provision of law, or even if there, there's an appropriation of additional funds, that that addresses the core issue of the inherent complexity of like the thing that we have that is FISMA. Is it perfect? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I, could, there, could there be improvements that are there? Yeah. But um, it's, it's standing law, and I don't have any expectation that's going to change. So trying to operate and do good things within the construct that we have um, feels more practical to me than waiting till we to fix some of these things. I think that it's possible for us to have a cake and to eat it too, or at least to get to that point. Um, so I think that we can achieve some of the benefits that come from a central approach, but do so under the norms that the, the current law creates. Um, most of the reasons that I think that people want for CISA to be a front door for the federal executive agencies, I think can be addressed in a more meaningful way than CISA immediately being in the middle of vulnerability reports. Um, I think that there's value in minimizing the number of layers between the initial reporter and the team that's actually performing remediation. That's, I think that's most likely to re result in a speedy and secure uh, outcome. So when people say, well, uh, th th this is the thing that I think that uh, will come out of a, a central uh, a central source, or central place that we would report it, well, they, they want to be able to ensure that all agencies have the same vulnerability disclosure policy, particularly with respect to, the, to uh, prosecution. Um, I want that, too. I think that what you're really saying there is that you want equivalent protection for researchers across the executive branch. That doesn't necessarily mean that all agencies have the same policy. It means that you can have, you know, w w words are words, and we can accomplish the same goal in, in slightly different ways. Um, you know, I hear some folks say, well, let's create a single point of intake for vulnerability reports. That's like having a, a, you know, a, a single 911 number. Um, that's actually not how 911 works. Um, there is one single number, but it works geographically. When you call 911, you don't call Washington, D.C., and we don't route your, your phone call to uh, your state, to your county, and to your city. But having kind of a, a, a virtual identifier of 911 is really powerful. That can occur the same way through a security app or providing a way for people to, be able to find out and discover what, you know, uh, you can unify the mode of discovery even if you don't unify the, re the reporting mechanism. Um, so the other piece I hear people say is, well, we want to assure that all agencies' information systems are covered by the policies. I want that too. But I think that if we do that immediately, it would be pretty painful. Let's, let's walk uh, before we, we force people to sprint. Um, so the other piece that I, I, I really want is actually in line with the vulnerabilities equities policy is that when, I think there's a sense that when people are going to report a vulnerability and say, agency, I found something, this is a problem, that we then are going to take that thing that you've reported for defensive purposes, purposes and you know, go to an interagency council and be able to say, oh, well, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll hang on to that and use it for offensive purposes. Um, I, I think that we can get to a point, and I think it's in line again with what the VEP says, that we would make it very plain uh, that that would not be a thing, that the things that are reported to us would be for remediation, as well as for things that come out of uh, you know, R&D and the research community. So what might the potential requirements of a potential uh, a directive or an MMO or a requirement, a mandate for federal agencies to do some of this better? We want to enable them to be able to receive unsolicited reports. So we could do this a couple ways. One that we may do is to say, you need to set a security contact for each.gov domain. It's interesting, the whole world is running away from who is. But in 2018, the .gov registry made it possible that, that all .gov domains, not just federal, in fact, uh, plug 80% of the .gov, the number of .gov domains are uh, state and local. So they're non-federal. Um, but we made it possible so that the you know, individuals could be able to set a public security contact, and hey, it'll show up in who is. Um, so this is pretty powerful. So if you find something on a .gov and there's a security contact, you should consider reaching out there first. Check, check, uh, check port 43. Um, I, I don't actually know who the security contact is here, Sissa. Um, but uh, here, going back to all my emails, I, I did kind of cheat. Again, like, I didn't check this. I really just wanted to email the security ads. I could have uh, prioritized the uh, addresses that were here. Uh, but again, this could be a mandatory thing. We could say, you need to have a clearly identifiable security contact for your domain, and it needs to be representative. You know, the, the, whatever that box hits, the folks who are there ought to be able to triage anything that's on that, that domain. Um, one of my favorite papers in the last few years um, is, is called You've Got Vulnerability. 
Uh, so the team evaluated different methods of providing vulnerability notifications. They said, well, do we do it directly to the domain point of contact through who is? Do we send it to a, a national cert? Should we send a long message or a short message? Should we send it in English or based upon the content that's at the host name? Should we try and translate it? And then they compared that with the observed rates of patching after they provided vulnerability notification. Great, great paper. Um, this was my favorite section of the paper. Basically, it says that you know we sent a bunch of data to, to, to US CERT, and then we asked other CERTs uh, they had said that we we're going to send it. You know, they, they, they didn't pass the message. Effectively, sending vulnerability notifications to a central CERT was no better than the control group. And they said that they had better results uh, sending it to the domain points of contact. This was pretty energizing to me and was part of the reason that I had tried to advocate to get uh, .gov to stick domain points of contact back in WHOIS. Great paper. Um, so more potential requirements that this could be. We would instruct agencies to develop and publish a vulnerability disclosure policy. No PDFs, needs to be on a web page, needs to be in text or in HTML. Uh, we would instruct them what the policy would look like. We would say you need to uh, define, at least upon outset, the set of initial uh, systems that are in scope. Um, you would define the types of tests that would be authorized. You would say this is where we're going to uh, receive vulnerability reports. That could be at your security contact. It could be at a platform that you have uh, procured or, or that you might manage. Um, you are going to you know, commit to a, a remediation timeline and say, you know, it, it's our goal to be able to remediate these in 90 days. That, of course, doesn't require people to uh, abide by that, but a pledge to adhere to that timeline. Um, as well as, a, clearly, a commitment by the agency to uh, you know, a, a promise not to sue if you abide by, in good faith, the, the policy that's been outlined. Um, the, I mean, let me come back real fast to security.txt. Um, but the other thing that could be done is an instruction to tell agencies, hey, upon issuance, you need to have one system, host name, you know, an asset, uh, within scope of your, your VDP. And it needs to increase within periodicity. Um, and then set a deadline and say, well, within two years' time, all of your internet accessible systems need to be in scope. Um, this is something that could be tracked. You, you then have a, a meaningful metric with, you, you could be able to evaluate where are things being added to the scope? Um, so a couple interesting things that could be done with a, a security security.txt file. So here, here's on the screen uh, Google's security.txt. So there's a couple of fields there that say here's our contact. Uh, you can find where their vulnerability disclosure policy is. Um, if we told agencies and instructed them to put a security.txt in a well-known place, it just provides for one more opportunity for folks to be able to find where, where in the world I send this thing, this problem that I found. Um, that also provides a mechanism where we could say, scan these out and be able to follow the vulnerability disclosure policy and check for the scope and do, do a diff uh, uh, based upon time. Uh, so a quick analogy, this is actually being done. Uh, Code.gov, which is a program that the General Services Administration manages, um, they, they manage a program that was begun or at least a, uh, was pushed along by the Federal Source Code Policy, which was another MMO uh, that came out of uh, OMB. There was an instruction here uh, down at the bottom to tell agencies you need to have a code.json, uh, a code inventory that you will manage and maintain, and it's going to go on your agency website. The code.gov folks then scan that out. It's in a defined schema that they instruct uh, agencies to, to pull things in. And then it makes it so that people can be able to find uh, code underneath uh, uh, near top level um, agencies. So you can say, show me all the code that the Department of Homeland Security publishes. This is a, a, a project that our team works on to be able to scan out uh, HTTPS within the federal government. It's a, it's a requirement. So we were able to, tr to track that. Similarly, maybe there could be kind of like a code.gov, there could be a vulnerability.gov site. To make it really easy, you can go to that one place to be able to see, and we'll scan out the, the, uh, you know, the information and then represent it on a site that you could punch in a host name and say, is this in scope? <laughs> What's the point of contact that I send this to? And that itself could either be the point uh, of reporting, or it could just you know, point you to other places out of band of, of the site. Um, the out of band mechanism may be uh, more beneficial just because it's challenging to stand up a new system. Uh, particularly in, in this instance, you'd have to manage the authentication piece. Uh, it, it's just hard to, to do systems and start, stand up new infrastructure in the US government. So more, more potential requirements. So um, it, none of this matters if the agency doesn't have, if, if the agency doesn't action the, the finding. Uh, so there would be a requirement for them to have handling procedures inside their organization. 
a lot of that is really influenced by the norms and the tools available to the organization. This is less a technical problem than it is in an organizational one. Um, and I don't think that we can solve it with technology, but by defining these are the things that ought to be in your handling procedures and providing good implementation guidance, I think that that's uh, accomplishable. Um, record reporting requirements. I think there's a nat natural tension as an, an enterprise. Again, my organization doesn't run or maintain these systems to say, well, you know, cut us fully off. We don't need to be in the loop. So there, there could be a, a function where we would need to receive some kind of a, a push from uh, agency information security teams to say, well, these are the number of reports we've seen. These are the ones that are outstanding. Um, you know, they, they could try and characterize that. In my mind, this is the greatest value of having a platform because then the metrics gathering just becomes a function of people using the system. Um, and I think, again, that's a thing that, that we could get to. Other things. Um, I do think, and this is similar to what uh, the UK's NCSC, the National uh, Cybersecurity Center, does. They, are, they, they point people similarly to say, uh, if you find something on a, on a gov.uk system, go find the system owner and, and, and tell them. But if they're not responsive or you don't know who to tell, tell us. I think, that, I think that's a role that, that we could play. Um, you know, again, we can try and do a base level of evaluation and, and triaging and saying, is this real? I think that's, that's powerful. Um, but there's also something to be said, like to n allow agencies to flex those muscles and be able to experience the process of like, is this a real thing? Some of those base level evaluation of like, is this a vulnerability are things that agencies, that I, I am loath to remove from agencies. We want them to have, to have those, those skills because it's just part and parcel of, of working in security. Um, I, I mentioned, I think that any kind of a direction, we would try and be as clear as possible and, and offer them. There, there's, a, you know, there, there's great prior art, prior art here. Not only are there great vulnerability disclosure policies within the government and, and external, but there are great guides talking about how to manage programs like this. There are ISO standards that exist um, that we could point agencies to as well. Um, I, this guidance, I also, we would be really clear to disambiguate that that, hey, a vulnerability disclosure policy is not a, a bug bounty. An individual agency could choose to incentivize on particular systems or on particular sets of data. Um, uh, this, I think, would be something separate from that. I don't think it would, it would prohibit, um, but it wouldn't make uh, mandatory either. So like learning to operate, I think there's a, there's a high likelihood of, that this being painful uh, for, for agencies as they try and figure this out. And, I, and um, I think it's incumbent upon us to try and better defend um, the, the, the American people's information. Um, my favorite thing to tell federal agency CIOs and CISOs is I, I, I don't care about your agency. I don't care about your security. I care about the citizens who are required to put things in your system. Um, that, that is energizing to me, and that's what, what motivates me. Um, I, I think that there's um, something to be said for uh, the US government trying to approach information security practitioners and trying to tell folks how to do their job when our house is clearly not in order. So we lack credibility in trying to direct or instruct or say, you should do it this way when there's a lot more that we can do on our side. And I think if we can demonstrate some heightened competence, um, I think that then we, we'll be an invitee, not just because we're the government, but because there's some demonstrated uh, competence there. So. Um, the, the aim here is to try and improve things. Um, I have a sense that we're pretty close on some of these things, and that there will be opportunities to provide more formal comment and, and, and direction and feedback. But, but we're here, and we're happy to take any questions and to, and to hear feedback and concerns from you all. Um, we, we're, we're trying to act in good faith and recognize the different incentives that individual agencies uh, labor under um, while trying to push them along to do things that are like, um, they're, they're, they're not necessarily uh, complicated, but they are hard for these agencies. Any other thoughts you want to offer? Perfectly. Cool. That's all that we have. Uh, thanks for hearing us out. Our email addresses are on the screen. Internet, send us an email. Um, we we're happy to, to take comments and questions. Thanks. If anyone has questions, yeah, I'll come. Um, so knowing and understanding that there's a couple of micro agencies out there that have very small shops, have you guys done any sort of research as to like starting up a vulnerability disclosure program, the kind of 
flow of input that's going to be coming from the community because when you think about it we've got the whole world right the whole world could be looking into your vulnerability disclosure program and could be submitting findings um, so do you have have you done any research to kind of look at the like whether it's going to be a fire hose even if it's just one system like on average what that kind of looks like you want to take first shot? Yeah, so um, we're, we're very cognizant that the Marine Mammal Commission doesn't have the same kind of resources that the Pentagon or HHS has. We, we always crack on the Marine Mammal Commission if you're a government dork, you know that. They're great people, great people, and we all care about the dolphins. Um, but no, it's, it's a real concern, and so part of what we've thought about and sort of socialized internally is, well, we can require all the, the CFO Act agencies, so the 24 largest uh, federal agencies, to do this. And then sort of work, there is like a small agency CISO, like sort of Information Security Council that works across these issues and provides recommendations on sort of how to address their particular issues. Now, I can't imagine that we would force the smallest agencies who have one person that is both their CIO, their CISO, their chief data officer, the other chiefs that either Congress or OMB has told them to make. They're basically just one person or like two people, right? Uh, so we can't do that. Um, but another thing that, that Cameron and I have discussed and our, our agencies have discussed is what if... Uh, what if you make DHS or uh, what if you make them the entity to receive that information on behalf of the smalls and try to work across them, right? Uh, there should be somewhere to report that. Or, or the smalls can say like, hey, uh, here's our vulnerability disclosure policy, report it to these people. Like we, like we are not gonna be able to deal with that based on our sort of budget and everything else, but we understand that this is uh, important and we hear you. We just wanna make sure that whatever agency is doing this, that they provide a good sort of citizen experience to the community that's trying to report, right? There's one of the things that this administration cares an awful lot about, and it goes back to EO 13800, right? We operate sort of information technology on behalf of the American people, right? So uh, we want to make sure that no matter what experience you have, if you find information, if you want to report it to us, we, we, we accept it and we try, to, we try to work with it, right? And put it in our workflow and make sure that we mitigate those issues or, or address any vulnerability. Uh, with respect to the, uh, the the tons of other things that agencies, sort of IT and information security shops, have to have to deal with, um, but it's a it is one of the problems we have to solve for. Whether we just sort of stay silent, whether we provide additional resources to those folks, whether we try to come up with some sort of hybrid approach, um, it's it's messy and it's hard. But and, and they're a they're a massive attack vector, right? They they don't have as much time to put in. Uh, that folks in much larger agencies with massive budgets are, are able to accomplish. I'll, I'll give comment as well. I think that there can be some targeting with any kind of a, a directive or, or a mandate. Um, you know, I don't see any reason, uh, you know, CISA willing, uh, for individual smaller agencies to have their security contact be us. You know, th that seems like something that could be negotiated and worked out. But I think particularly for like the, the larger agencies, th these are competencies that we want them to have and that they should be able to maintain and manage. Great. Yeah, thank you for giving this talk and pushing this forward. Um, so one question I had is, what about the state and local governments? Because given like the distributed nature of that, we can't just go and push vulnerability disclosure onto them. Um, but at the yep. same time, having each of them individually create a VDP might get really messy, especially for some of the, um, say, local governments that have less resources. And given like all of the attacks we're seeing targeting these smaller localities, what can we do to, say, provide resources or make it easier for them to work with this community to receive reports? So we, in, our, in our brand of federalism, you know, they, they maintain sovereignty. Um, so there wouldn't be a, a force here. I think that there can be opportunity for uh, federal side to provide additional services. So one, one idea, you know, uh, it, it makes a lot of sense to me that the .gov registry is available to U.S.-based government organizations. Why not send these reports directly to .gov and they could triage that, or they could triage it on, on behalf, or they, I mean not triage, but they could ensure to pass them to the technical contacts at uh, state and local .govs. So there's a couple ways that that could be done. Some of it is just like uh, blog about these things, you know, it, make them known and suggest that you know that that could be a thing that would be meaningful. Um, but I think also the more that we're able to demonstrate as as a federal government that like hey, these things are doable, we can accomplish these things and show states and locals how to do it, give them good feedback, show them the, some of the lessons learned, give them you know, uh, what we did but present on a smaller scale, I think that they'll be able to, to learn from that as well. 
Yeah, think, I agree. I mean, it, it's it's hard. Like OMB's policy authority is just federal, like federal executive branch, right? Like there are things that we do that have knock-on effects, whether intended or unintended, all the way down to, to state and locals. Uh, but there's no way we would force them uh, to, to do that. Um, but if they're competent, capable, and can use all the, the, the ISO standards and use the BDPs that are already <laughs> published publicly or other uh, work that they see from the from federal agencies and do it within a way that makes sense for them as, a, as an entity, uh, you know, we would support that and provide guidance and support and, and be willing to listen and help them however we can. The, the other piece that I just recalled is that on, on the .gov uh, registry site, there is um, th there are some domain security best practices, and it does include some resources about VDP in there. So I think just, just by letting people know that this is a thing is, it can be pretty powerful, too. All right, I'm trying to, I'm torn between showing severe gratitude and empathy and also playing a cynic. So go for it. Do both. What one question on the first and then one question <laughs> on the second? Um, I mean, I, I love what I, I've heard. I want to listen to it again, watch the recording, see the slides, because you have taken some nuanced approaches to maybe take a bite of the elephant one bite at a time. The the cynic in me says, I mean, some of us were involved in the NTA multi stakeholder process yeah. that wrote the template. Which is I, top I, notch. I, go read I, it. I ran that. I, I wrote the first draft template. We argued about it for a year. It's it was meant to be brain dead simple, and the scope, the throttle was really what's your initial scope was the first phrase initial scope. So it could just be your top level domain. I mean, um, I got a lot of guff from the hacker community saying crawls too slow, right? And what I if I want to put my cynical hat on, this is a crawl to a crawl to a crawl, and. How do we could we go faster? So later in the presentation, I felt less anxious about that. Um, but there may be some things like you know, the, the requirement could be something. For example, I don't want to workshop it on the fly, but it could be something like every agency has to do a pilot using this template and report back to your metrics. Like kind of like I think you were almost going where my brain went. So maybe some hallway conversation. But a lot of folks do want to get to the more advanced cases, and and it's not even a burden. I almost wondered if we were implicitly assuming this is a burden. I, I instituted one of these in my private sector job, and I just picked one product, and I kept it real narrow. Yep. You could do a pilot for a short amount of time. I did it perpetual. But what it showed the teams was, oh wait, we've got a flaw in our SDLC. Can we improve that? What kind of moves can we make further left in the process so we don't have these expensive things? How much worse would this have been if it was an adversary who found this? So it stimulates a lot of positive feedback loop. It can also be pressure on your suppliers or your yep. government contractors that weren't doing a good job. Yep. So it's not always a bad experience. The, the idea of a pilot is you start small, start early, and then iterate. And uh, you know, one of our models in the cavalry track where you are is safer sooner together. Part of that is the sooner. So I, I'm all for what bold action can we take, even if it's tiny or time bound or scope narrowly. And that's where I'd want to press on this is I, I, I totally understand the constraints you typically have. We also want to get to the point where we're, we're at least starting the journey so that we can accelerate the pace later. Yeah, and I, great question. And I totally agree as someone that has been in the government for many years now and is, and is still not a cynic. It's, uh, uh, it, it's easy to get cynical, but I, I try to be positive, at least in this respect. If you ever see me in a working environment, I would seem to be the most negative person with all four letter words uh, that are out there. Um, no, I, I totally agree, and it, it's because of the work. Th this just goes to show you how slow the sort of government operates, right? If anybody saw Alan Friedman's presentation yesterday, sorry, I forgot. About multi-stakeholderism? Yeah, I, I forgot my gold jacket. I was <laughs> on it, but um, it didn't really go with the with the preppy outfit. Um, the the work that Alan talked about on the S bomb stuff, the we're not going to see any real output on that for a year, two years, three years, four years. That's just the way the system operates, and you can press in certain places. But for what Cameron and I want to see happen, like we want, to, uh oh, you're, no, 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 let, let him go before you come back. But like, that's what it's about, right? In fact, I, I almost find it comical and sort of weird in a way that all that work that happened uh, on the ISO standards and everything else three years ago, that it's not already federal policy, right? We should have done this two years or three years ago, right? An agency should already be sort of standing up and walking now, right? But when that happened, you have uh, a, a new election, a new administration, a new set of priorities, a new, a, a new uh, concept on budget and agency responsibilities and everything else. So the things that seem like intrinsically 
easy and, and doable in the community when we're out here speaking with you, once it gets put inside the grinder, not just inside my organiz oh, sorry, my organization or Cameron's or, or the agencies out there, it's always a lot harder than uh, folks imagine, uh, which is why like we, we come to events like this and we do this work recognizing that yes, we know we're behind the ball, we wanna start the ball rolling and then have you come help push as fast as you can, right? There's there's some stuff we can do inside, but it's only when you build build up a lot of capacity or a lot of influence from the outside that this happens. And if we don't do it, and I know we've got some, some representatives from the, the legislative branch in here, we're gonna get laws from Congress that tell us to do things in a very specific way, which may be totally orthogonal or, or antagonistic to what the community wants to see happen. And agencies will do it uh, in, a, in a very ham-handed, backwards way. I mean, there, there was a bill passed at the end of the last Congress that has a particular agency who's forced to write a vulnerability disclosure policy and to run a bug bounty. And when... It was the Department of Homeland <laughs> Security. And, 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 I'm, and I'm not going to name names. It's not Cameron's part, but it's another part of it. But, but I still remember the first conversation we had with the office that was going to be responsible for doing that. And they're like, we don't want to do this. This is nonsense. We don't want to know about that stuff. I got pen tests that tell me everything I need. I've got more vulnerabilities than I've got money to do with, right? So you can see the sort of institutional issues that that we're dealing with. Um, and you know, in some cases, I think it's a, it's a perfectly viable approach uh, for OMB to come in and sort of say, hey, this is thou shalt do X, right? So like after the OPM breach, uh, the government sort of closed in, right? Decision making got very close. Like everything was run out of the White House. Everything was security first, all times, like everything down, period. We're in control. Agencies, you don't make your own decisions. This administration, to, to its credit, I think, has actually given a lot more trust back to agencies, right? It's more focused on sort of mission and service delivery and, and, and citizen services. But there's still these very important sort of baseline capabilities or baseline programs that still need to happen regardless, right? So. Cameron and I are fighting this sort of fundamental tension in sort of where the government as an executive branch entity is operating now. Uh, the other sort of external constraints, be it from industry, from the information security community, uh, from Congress, everything else, uh, are forcing us to make decisions. But it's, it, and it, I know it's not satisfactory to answer in this way, Josh, but it, it's because of all that work that was started two years ago, that community building, that we're getting to where we are now. And then if it gets in and it gets institutionalized and it works and it's better than the stuff we have, like um, you know the crazy amount of FISMA reporting we do every every quarter and the yearly IG assessments that as soon as they're issued to agencies they start audits all over again so an agency can't fix anything that an IG says. If this works and we get better outcomes at lower cost, we can reduce a lot of the other stuff we're doing that's not nearly as important and is not driving real outcomes, right? So uh, I wish it wasn't so much of a process, but you know, I'm a I'm a, I'm a bureaucrat by trade. In case anyone in the audience <laughs> couldn't couldn't tell that, but like th like being inside and fighting those battles and trying to force folks to do this, like it's not sexy, it's not fun, it's it's not easy, but um, it's worthwhile. And it will never be enough for you all. But like the part is, we have to keep coming out here, we have to keep learning more, we have to keep figuring out newer and creative ways to, to make that happen inside government because it's the right thing to do. And it shouldn't be the fact that we OMB or Cameron Assista has to tell agencies sh to do it. Um, they should be picking up themselves, but when they're not, we have to be the force that kind of helps push them in a better direction. Three quick thoughts. So on the home dot, dot, gov, dot, gov, that's lots of dots and, and gov. Um, <laughs> if you go there and you go to the security, uh, domain security best practices, the NTIA's work is cited there. It's great. Like people, sh people should read it and people should use that. Um, we, we, we may point people in the direction of that template. Um, number two, the more that you all talk and blog and write and say, why isn't this problem solved? The more ammunition that gives us inside our agencies to be able to say, hey, look, it's not just us inside. Um, so like, do, do more of that, please. And thank you for the, one, the, the work that you do. Um, I threw up in, in the talk several like, nominal timelines of, you know, 90 days and two years, those are all pretty hand wavy at this point. So, and it's, it's not clear to me, those are the right timelines. Um, I, I would love to move much faster and say, you know, you, you need to do this in a year. One of the directives that we issued uh, in late 2017 required agencies double down on, on the HTTPS uh, mandate because we could tell the agencies weren't doing it, but also instructed them, you need to authenticate your email. You need to get to a point be at your domain, at the, top, at the second level domain, get to a DMARC policy of reject. And we gave them a year to do that. Um, that was pretty painful for them. And lots of, lots of outsiders say, you'll never get there. And we didn't get to 100%, but we went from about 2% to about 87%. 
Um, that, that, that's a huge win. Um, and so like being aggressive and setting some timelines, uh, a, a, a dear colleague of mine once said that humans just like, uh, bureaucracies just like humans need deadlines. Um, so setting a line in the sand and saying, this is what you need to get towards m allows for some organizational inertia to move in the right direction. Okay, I think we ran out of time. Um, thank you to our speakers. Really good talk. Thanks all. Thank you.